Hey everybody, it's Charles from HumbleMechanic.com. Today I'm taking your questions on catch cans, coolant, fuel pressure regulators, and more. This is episode 223 of the Humble Mechanic Podcast. Remember, in order to get a question on a show like this, email me, charles at HumbleMechanic.com, and put question for Charles in the subject. Also, if you don't see your question on a show like this, be sure to check out the quick videos playlist on YouTube where I do one question per video. And there's also an audio only version of these and most other shows you can check out on iTunes, Stitcher, or of course at humblemechanic.com. All right, let's talk about the sponsor of the day, which is CRP Automotive. CRP deals in a ton of OE maintenance and repair parts, timing belt kits, suspension components, and even fluids. In fact, they make the factory DSG fluid for Volkswagen and Audi. So check them out at crpautomotive.com. And remember, if you want exclusive content, discounts to places like Black Forest, Eastwood, MT Knives, Sonic Tools, Eurowise, Prime Shades, and more, check out the crew membership program. There's a link down in the description. I will just leave it at that for today. Let's get into your questions. First one comes from Christian. I have a 13 Jetta S with 60K. I've noticed the coolant reservoir has changed colors. Before it was bright pink, now it is dark red, almost brown. My question is, should I be worried? And do you think I should change the coolant? So Christian also sent a couple pictures, which good job on you. Looking at this, just purely in the picture, it looks like, yes, you need to change the coolant. Was it because someone put the wrong fluid in the coolant? I hope not, or use the wrong coolant? I sure hope not. The most common way that this happens, it's two ways really. The most common way is that the oil cooler is leaking. And it's not leaking where it's leaking like coolant out of it or oil out of it, it is leaking internally. So one of those seals inside the cooler is actually started to leaking and what's happening is oil's getting pushed into your cooling system. The oil is under more pressure generally so it pushes oil into the coolant. This can make like a milkshake of coolant almost. That's what used to happen a lot on the older Passats is that it would make almost a milkshake consistency type fluid inside the coolant. But with yours, it doesn't really look that bad. So you may be at the very early stages of it. Also, it may not just be that. It may be something else, a head gasket. Uh, a Jetta S I don't think is a diesel, but EGR can actually cause something very similar to that as well, leaking EGR cooler. So if you are a gas engine, I'm going to guess that it's the oil cooler. It's a pretty common failing component. And yes, you do need to replace the oil cooler first. And then you need to get all that nasty, oily, coolanty mix out of the system. The way we used to do it at the dealership was we would put the new oil cooler on. We would, of course, drain the cooling system. We'd fill it with water and a little bit of Dawn dish soap or whatever grease fighting dish soap is your preference and we'd run the car just in the shop flush it with just water uh, run it again flush it just water run it again flush it soap and water and do these a handful of times till we would get no more oily mix out of the system and by using water it makes it really easy to see when you still have little tiny oil mix deposits in the in the fluid and then once that's all out, and there's no real reason to waste all that coolant either since you're just gonna you know, recycle it anyway. After it was all out, we would do one more flush with coolant and then we would drive the car and make sure that it was good. You do wanna make sure though, if you're using some kind of liquid soap, you get it all out. You don't wanna leave that in the system. There are also harsher treatments that'll probably work as, as well or maybe even a little bit better, but for how cheap a bottle of dish soap is at you know the local store, that was what our go-to was. But yes, dude, you do wanna get that out of there. You wanna get it replaced. You're probably gonna to need to purchase a new coolant bottle as well because that slimy mess get stuck on the prongs of the sensor and it can make your coolant level sensor get all wonky and wacky, either not going off when it's supposed to or going off too soon. But yes, if you guys do experience coolant looking like this, you do wanna get it replaced and find out why it looks like that. The coolant on our Volkswagen and Audis is supposed to be lifetime. That usually means about 100,000 miles, not the entire life of the vehicle. Which all right, next up is from Miles about catch cans. I have a Mark 6 GTI and I have a catch can and a PCV replacement due to my PCV failing and me wanting a more permanent fix for the issue facing the TSI motor. And now my intake runner flaps have gone bad. I know that the intakes have a warranty on them. My question is, will the catch can and PCV affect the warranty on the intake manifolds as it does completely bypass the hose that went back to the inside of the intake? Okay, so Miles, this really depends on the dealership you take it to. If you brought that car to me, 
okay? As a dealer tech, Charles, right? As a dealer tech, and you had an intake manifold flap code, I would fix it. The only place you might be responsible for something is if I have to do extra work beyond the straight R&R &R of the intake manifold. So let's say, for example, I have to remove your catch can or I have to remove your PCV valve uh, replacement part, even if it's one bolt, right? If it's one bolt, you are gonna have to pay for that. I'm gonna charge you for that because my time is only covered to do the repairs that sits on a factory vehicle, not a modified vehicle. Some of you out there are like, Charles, it's just one bolt, that's really dumb. Okay, that's fine. And when I get paid according to that, I don't have a problem with it. But as a warranty job, I'm paid to do the car and fix the car as it sits factory, not modified. So that's the only thing you may be responsible if you brought it to me because all those manifolds failed. That's why they have an updated part, right? It is the most common failing component on the TSI engine, period. I would take care of it. I wouldn't give you a hard time about your, your catch can. I wouldn't give you a hard time about your PCV. None of it. I would take care of it. Unless you were a jerk about it, then, I'm, <laughs> then I might be less likely to help you. But if you're just cool and like a normal customer, then it's, it's no problem. That's not always the case. If you take it to a dealer and the guy hooks a scan tool up and runs faults and is running the warranty scan and lifts the hood and says, oh, aftermarket parts not covered. It is at the discretion of the technician and the dealership and the service manager whether to or not to cover things because it could be technically outside influence. Now, I don't think it is, and that is, again, one of the most common failing things on these cars, period, but you have guys that do not want anything to do with working on anything modified, and they're going to say it's not covered. The a way around that is to call Volkswagen and not complain, but ask for guidance, right? It's this subtle change in verbiage that we use to ask for guidance on what to do because it is so common and because they all fail, whether it's modified or whether it's stock. We always took the approach of if I can't go because of your modified part, this is bad, then we covered it, right? All right, next one up is from Harold. I got two questions, 07 Passat, two liter turbo. Can the part at the end of the input camshaft that actuates a high pressure pump through the follower be replaced or must the entire camshaft be replaced? Okay, I'm gonna answer this one. As far as I know, you need to put a camshaft on it, okay? There may be a solution to only replacing that piece, that lobe piece, or there may be an aftermarket camshaft that that piece is serviceable, but I couldn't find it and I don't know of any offhand. That camshaft replacement is one of the most common BPY failures uh, because of the high pressure pump failure and it, and it wears into the camshaft. We always put a cam on the car. Even if there was a tiny bit of damage, we would put a cam on the car. I'm guessing that's what you're gonna have to do too because I don't know of any, but if you guys in the comments, you know of any, drop it down and let's help Harold out with that. Odds are you're just gonna end up putting a camshaft on it. Even if you can you know, press off and press on a new lobe piece, it's probably just easier, cheaper, and less hassle just to get a new cam. All right, Harold, second question. What pressure readings are correct for a fuel rail when the engine is switched on but not running and when the engine is running? Harold, uh, when it's running at idle, roughly 40 bar is the high pressure side, and that's the reading you'll read in the scan tool at the rail. Um, you know, within a couple bar of that is where you want to be. When it's not running is really going to depend on the temperature. So if the car's cold and you cut the key on, you'll probably see roughly in-tank fuel pressure, roughly. If you had just driven the car and it's hot and up to temp and you shut the car off, it's actually gonna go up because of that heat soak in fuel, the pressure will rise. And that's actually what we use to diagnose high pressure fuel pump failure. If we're driving the car, it's really hot, we shut the car off, well, I guess in this case, it's a Passat push button, start, shut the car off, and we don't see that pressure spike and go up, um, we know we have a failing check valve inside the high pressure pump. There's a pressure retention valve that holds that pressure in the rail, and if that pressure doesn't spike, right, if it bleeds off, then we know that the high pressure pump, pump is failing. That can cause like extended crank after a hot start and things like that, or when the car's been sitting for a while, it can cause both of those. So that's what you wanna look at, about 40 bar at idle, and then depending on temperature, it'll depend on what the behavior of the, um, of the pressure sensor inside the rail and the pressure inside the rail will be.
All right, last one of the day. Hey, Charles, I got an 81 Caddy with a 97 VR6 swapped into the car. I'm cool with that. Car's been running great until all of a sudden, now my car is having issues. I can get the car to start and run, giving it some gas. I cannot get the car to idle on its own. I have checked the math, O2 sensors, and connecting parts. I was wondering how I would test my fuel pressure regulator, or do you have any idea what's going on? The OBD port is missing, unfortunately. Okay, I would go back in time and put the OBD port on. Um, I don't see the reason why to shoot yourself in the foot for diagnostic capabilities, but since we don't have that option, let's talk about we, what we can do. First to your fuel pressure regulator question. The way I like to check those is a couple of ways. First, what I like to do is with the car off, I'll take a vacuum pump, I'll disconnect the vacuum line to the fuel pressure regulator, put my pump on, and I'll pump it up and make sure it holds vacuum. That'll show you whether the diaphragm is split in it or not. And honestly, that's really the best way to test it because either the diaphragm split and it's not gonna hold vacuum and you probably pull some fuel into your vacuum gauge, or it's fine and it's working fine. Now, what we also need to think about though is vacuum supply to the fuel pressure regulator. Is it getting? the fuel pressure, the vacuum supply that it needs. So what we can do there is we can put our vacuum gauge into the vacuum line, right? Start the car up and read our vacuum reading. If the car's not running right, the vacuum's gonna be all wonky and all over the place, but that's something you wanna look at too. So as far as what else is going on, um, you know, I don't know. One other thing on the O2 sensor, what you can do is you can disconnect the line plug the vacuum line so you don't have a leak. And if you have a way to monitor your oxygen sensors, you said you checked them. Uh, not really sure how you checked it, but the same, whatever method you use to check it, if you're actually looking at like voltage readings, maybe you have an air fuel gauge, disconnect the line and plug it and see what your fuel gauge reading does. It should start showing rich, rich, rich um, because you're not regulating fuel pressure. As far as what else is going on, dude, it could be anything. It could be a coolant temp sensor. It could be an airflow meter, an oxygen sensor. You could have a vacuum leak, a spark plug. I mean, guys, there's a vacuum, uh, ground. It could be a bad ground. There's so many things that could be wrong with this car. And unfortunately, without just going step by step by step, how are you going to know? You have no computer to hook up, which is not a big deal. But now we need to start with basics. Do we have good spark? Do we have good quality fuel? Do we have good pressure delivery from the tank up to the car? Uh, what does it do off idle? Do we have an air hose that's not put on all the way or a vacuum line that's not put on all the way or maybe the intake's loose? I mean, uh, uh, a coolant temp sensor, I think I already said that, but there's it, it could be anything. It could be anything causing it not to idle. This is why when we do swaps of 96 and newer cars, it seems crazy to me not to put the OBD connection, you know, the two or three wires for the OBD port so that you can just plug your scanner in and look and see, at least see what the computer's seeing that does make diagnosing cars so much easier. But since we don't have that, start from the basics, double check your grounds, double check, you know, visual inspection, make sure all your vacuum lines are hooked up, make sure that all of your spark plug wires are put on. You say it won't idle, but is it misfiring or is it just sputtering like it's gonna run out of gas. I, I, I can't know. I can make it's a bad coil pack. Coil packs are really common on these too. Um, so there's, there's a million things that it could be. Start with the basics that the car needs to run, fuel, spark, compression, uh, signal, and, and on, on that one is signal. Um, and, then, and then go out from there. I'm guessing if you do a very thorough visual inspection and start putting your hands on things, you're probably gonna find like a vacuum line off, like the brake booster vacuum line off or something like that. Or that pipe that goes from the intake manifold to the booster split, that's another really common one, depending on how you have your setup, but uh, it, it really all depends. So uh, good luck, man. And again, like always with these problems, guys, when you fix it or figure it out, please come back and post and let us know what it was. That may help someone else watching the video, reading the comments out of a jam and uh, does help the community at large. Guys, I'm gonna wrap it up there. Questions, comments, you know what to do. If you liked the video, hit that thumbs up. I'm about to go pull the transmission out of the white GTI for a limited slip differential install video. It's beautiful out, so I'm gonna go do that. If you want exclusive content, discounts you can't get anywhere else to places like MT Knives, Sonic Tools, Eastwood, Black Forest Industries, Eurowise, Scanner Danner, My Canic, who is an awesome supporter of me getting that R32. Check out the crew membership program. It's a great way to save some money, get some exclusive content, and uh, help support the show, which I really appreciate. All right, guys, thank you so much for watching. Have an awesome day. If you're listening, thanks for listening, and I will see you next time.